Hello, uh, this is the Contemplating Christian, Will and Samuel. Uh, we are going over the five ways today. So we're going to start with a quote, as always. This is by Aquinas himself, and actually all the arguments we're going over are just straight from his writings and how he articulated them, so we aren't re-articulating them. It's straight up what, what he said. So here's the quote we're going to start with. It says, the chief aim of sacred doctrine is to teach the knowledge of God not only as he is in himself, but also as he is the beginning of things and their last end, and especially of rational creatures. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people think that doctrine would just be talking about God, but one of the cool things Aquinas points out here is that um, <clears throat> it actually all revolves around not only who God is and how he acts, but also that he is the end of all things and beginning of all things. Um, and so that is just a cool thing to keep in mind as we're going through this. So uh, we could, in a sense, call the arguments we're going over um, part of doctrine, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so a quick word about natural theology, of which the five ways, Aquinas' five ways, are a prime example, maybe the, prime, the most prime example of what natural theology is, just for clarity's sake, natural theology is the practice of reasoning from our experience of the world around us to the existence of God, who is the ultimate explanation of the world around us. And different Christians feel more or less positively about natural theology. There are a lot of, a lot of Christians uh, that feel quite favorably towards it, that like to argue from natural theology, that think it's very valuable in apologetics, and there are other Christians who, who do not feel that way. And that's fine, and that's, there's a good discussion to be had there. I think we should seek a balanced position on the value of natural theology. It's not the end-all, be-all of all apologetic discussion or evangelism, as if you know you can come down like from the mountain of Mount Sinai with, with your proof for God's existence and everybody will just believe. Uh, that's not how things work in conversation at all. Um, and people are not just going to become Christians when they hear these arguments. But at the same time, that has happened. Many people have, have come to faith through uh, rational proofs and, and arguments for God's existence. That is certainly, I think, a means that the Holy Spirit uses to awaken us to the reality of God. And so we should seek a balance view, not saying there's no usefulness to these arguments or they're the best thing ever. I think we should seek a balance view, and that's, Aquinas would completely agree with that. Um, I think maybe the most important use for natural theology is actually the edification of believers, actually us being edified by this. Part of us loving God with our minds is to contemplate him and his attributes. Uh, we see that he is the final end of all things, like Samuel talked about. Mm -hmm. When we contemplate his existence and his attributes, his workings in the world, how he is the cause of all things around us, how he sustains everything in existence, I think this is actually a really good thing to think about as a Christian and to, to see God in everything. I think that's a really good practice. So natural theology is not just apologetic, but at its best, it's actually spiritually edifying and can be devotional even. So that is, that is kind of where we're coming from, mm -hmm. natural theology. Yeah, and I'm a testament to the the type of person that was reached through natural theology. So back when I was like 20 and started on my path of Christianity, it actually started with the um, argument from morality. That's how it started. Uh, and it was like a three-minute video on YouTube I watched, and boom, it, it changed my life, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, let's, let's go to the next point. So in these arguments or the ways that we're going to be talking about, we want to make this point of God is known in his effects and not in his essence. Um, so it's, it's really that we can't know God directly right now in a sense. We only know him by how he works through everything, so his effects in the world. Um, now, if, if you want to talk about that we will eventually uh, see his essence or be with him in, in heaven, you, you can, but right now we don't have that. Um, so... We, we do have scriptural basis for this, so we would point to something like uh, Psalm 53.1, which just says, uh, the fool in his heart says there is no God, but specifically Romans 1. And so here's what Romans 1, 19 through 20 says. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And so one thing we're actually going to be doing with these arguments or uh, ways to demonstrate God's existence is something we haven't done with the other arguments we did. We're actually going to show you the attributes that we can draw from these arguments 
So let's say with the first way, we'll go through it, and then we'll be like, this is what we can figure out about um, his divine essence. Or so, for example, his uh, immutability. Can we can we get that? Or his omnipotence, how he's all powerful. Can can we draw, uh, derive that from these arguments? So we're going to talk about that. Um, and then this next point of general and special revelation, we do want to uh, clarify a couple things about the limits. So general revelation, remember, that's just, uh, in general, how God reveals himself to everyone. Special revelation is specifically um, the Bible and what God reveals uh, through the Bible and, uh, and his people, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we can use the Trinity and the Incarnation for example. So we would hold that the Trinity is actually reflected in nature, and we can see it in nature, but we can't prove it from nature. So someone can't just be sitting here and then automatically just like be thinking about something and prove the Trinity if they didn't know about it before. The, tr uh, the idea of the Trinity or Jesus or God himself has to be given to us, and that's the special revelation. So God gives that to us, so the light of faith mm -hmm. as opposed to the light of reason, even though once we know about the Trinity, we can see it everywhere, right. okay? Um, so those are, those are just, just some, some ground rules that we're laying before we actually get into these things. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the okay, um, before we get into these arguments, we have to talk about something a little abstract. It's called, it's called causal chains. Um, Will's going to go over most of this, but I'm going to quickly explain the illustration over there. And the reason we're going over this is because most of these ways are based upon this idea. If you don't understand this idea, you're going to have a really, really hard time understanding all the ways, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, so this idea of causal chains, if we look at the image, it, it pretty just pretty much just shows us this uh, explanation and how it just keeps getting deferred. So, uh, why do, so at the top, it's actually a little cut off. It says, by P1, and then it says, why does P1 hold so-and-so? And then it goes to, oh, because of P2. Oh, why does P2 hold that? Oh, because of P3. And why does P3 hold that? Because of P4, and then so on and so forth. And you can just keep going and going and going forever and just adding like P5, P6, P7, and just keep explaining things all the way down. But the problem we're going to be running into is there has to be like a grounding. There has to be a um, kind of something that's that grounds all of this and it can't just keep going on in explanations because it would run into absurdities or it wouldn't make sense or um, what we would say is an infinite regress would be impossible. Will's going to go over that more now. Yeah. So yes, the idea of an infinite regress being an incoherent concept uh, is very essential for these arguments. Um, and we're going to talk about two different sorts of causal chains. Okay. You probably never like probably don't talk like that. You probably don't hear the word causal chain much, things like that. So just bear with the language here a little bit. But uh, two sorts of causal chains. And with some examples and illustrations, it helps and makes more sense. The first one we have up there is an accidentally ordered causal chain. Accidentally ordered causal chain. Think of this like a chain of dominoes. Think of this as one domino knocks over another one, knocks over another one, knocks over another one. A better example, I think, is uh, think, of a, think of a succession of fathers and sons. So if a father begets a son, and then that father dies, but the son is still there, and he can beget another son, he, he can become a father, and then so on and so forth. The next son can become a father by beginning a son himself. Okay, the crucial part of what makes this an accidental uh, ordered causal chain is that the causal power is independent. The, the causal power of one of the members, say one of the sons, is independent of all the other members of the series. That's what makes it an accidentally ordered causal series. The, the causal power is independent of the other members. And so therefore, if my father died, I still have the power to create a new person. I still have the power to be a father myself and to, and to beget a son myself. Okay? Um, an essentially ordered causal chain is what Aquinas is talking about in these arguments. That's what he's relying on more so, um, which is... I think a little harder to grasp, but by way of contrast, it'll help. An essentially ordered causal chain, think about it as happening all at the same time. Think about something happening in the here and now. Uh, instead of like events happening backwards in time back to the Big Bang, think of causal events happening in explanation right now, like vertically. Um, so a good way to think about this would be like a chandelier. So a chandelier, 
as it's said, are like even these lights here. The lights right now are being held up by a string, and the string is held up by something that's attached to the ceiling. But that's all happening at the same time, right? That's not like a, t a, a temporal explanation. There's an, ex there's an explanation of causes happening at the same moment. And that's an essentially ordered causal series. Does that make a little bit of sense? Josh. That's a good way to think about it, I think. Yeah. Um, so let me see where I'm at here again. Um, Aquinas is arguing from essentially ordered causal chains in his five ways. And in this sort of causal series, the causal power of the members is borrowed. So each member has a borrowed derivative power from the first member of the series. And ultimately, we say that that's God. Mm -hmm. That God is the thing that funds all of the causal power to the rest of the series. Uh, think of a... Uh, a chain of boxcars that's powered by an engine car. So one, one, one of the chains in, in, in the series has an engine, and the other cars on the train only have their power to move because that engine is there on one of the cars that's fueling the whole thing. Does that make sense? I think? Mm. Getting some nods? Yeah. I know it makes sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the members have a dependent causal power, whereas in an accidentally ordered series, it's an independent power. Uh, the, the famous illustration that Aquinas uses is that of a man holding a stick, moving a stone. Okay, so in that, if, if I'm if I'm like concurrently moving a stone with a stick, what explains the stone moving? Well, the stick. But the stick is explained by my arm, and my arm is explained by the motor neurons firing in my head moving. And and Aquinas says that if you don't have something at rock bottom, that is itself unchanged, that has no potential that is causing everything else without being itself caused, then you can't actually explain what's happening to begin with. You can't explain the change that's happening right then and there with the stick and the stone. So if you keep pushing back the layers of explanation, you're gonna arrive at a first cause that is itself uncaused. That's, that's what Aquinas is saying. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a good illustration for that, I think. So you can argue for God's existence from either of these two sorts of causal chains. If you familiar, familiarize yourself with these, a lot of natural theology will make sense. Um, you can argue for God's existence by a temporal series of, of changes and causes going backwards in time. You can do that, but that's not what Aquinas is, is focused on right now. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I got it. Uh, if we don't have something like this, if we don't have something that is itself uncaused, that gives everything else its causal power, Think of an endless series of IOUs that's never actually backed by any real money. It's like the illustration that, that Samuel talked about. You're just constantly deferring the explanation, but you're never actually explaining the thing that's, that's supposed to happen. Or an endless series of boxcars without a lead engine car powering the whole thing. Okay, so just understanding that idea is very important for the rest of this whole mm -hmm. talk. So if we lost you there, well, hopefully it starts to get in <laughs> Hopefully it'll make sense after we go through a couple of these. Did I miss anything? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, I think really the biggest thing is the infinite regress is incoherent because it doesn't explain everything. You just have to understand that there has to be a ground explanation that gives us a reason for why things are the way that they are. And we can't just keep pushing it off. Okay? Yeah. That's the big idea. We can't just keep pushing off explanations because that'll just leave us with a bunch of things unexplained. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, but here are the five ways we're going to be going over. Uh, so the five ways to demonstrate God's existence, and uh, Aquinas was also very particular with that with those words. He didn't he didn't say, oh, these are five ways to prove God's existence or arguments. He said the, these are five ways to demonstrate that He exists. So the first one is from motion and change. The second one is what we call efficient causality, which we, we'll we'll go over the efficient cause. Um, one is contingency, we'll also explain. Uh, the fourth is degrees of perfection. And then the fifth one is the final cause or end of things, um, which, again, we will go over. And remember, from each of these ways, we're going to list a couple attributes that we can figure out just from the argument. All right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to read the first one. So this is straight from Aquinas. Uh, and, and his work, Summa, Summa Theologiae. Uh, number one, motion, change, 
It says this, in the world, we can see that at least some things are changing. Whatever is changing is being changed by something else. If that by which it is changing is itself changed, then it too is being changed by something else. But this chain cannot be infinitely long, so there must be something that causes change without itself changing. This everyone understands to be God. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see why we went over the causal chains right away. Right. Okay, so again, just to reiterate that same paragraph that we laid out and to try to explain it a little bit further. Hopefully more explanation doesn't just make it more confusing. Hopefully it helps. Yeah. That's our hope. Uh, but this first way argues from what Aquinas actually calls motion, like the Latin word kind of relates more to motion rather than change. What he means, though, is change. And there's a couple different types of change. If I just think about, like, my water sitting in this room will get a little bit colder because this room's really cold or something like that. And so there's a type of change. Or I, if I move my hand from the left to the right, that's a type of change. And Aquinas is saying, if you, if you analyze what change is, change involves the actualization of a potential. So we don't use those words very much. But what that means is um, my arm has the potential to be over here. And then it actually is over there. But something has to make that happen. And so Aquinas says that something uh, that can only happen by something that's already actual, actualizing it. Okay. So for my hand to be over here, there has to be stuff in my arm that moves it that way. But for my, but for my arm to be able to be in a position to do that, there has to be other stuff behind it that's making that happen, like the, the neurons in my brain firing, so to speak. So again, we have this series of causes and changes that are, that are occurring. And a potential cannot actualize itself. Okay? So think of like uh, a cup of coffee has the potential to be warm, but it doesn't have the potential to be like orange juice. It can't just change into orange juice. So there are, I, there are inherent potentials in all the things around us, and those potentials need to be actualized by something outside of it that actualizes it. And Aquinas says that it, you need to have something at rock bottom that actualizes everything else without itself being actualized by anything. And if you don't have that, then you aren't able to explain any of the change that's occurring right now in the here and now. So he argues that this gets you down to what is called a, a purely actual actualizer is the way that a, a contemporary uh, Thomist might put it, somebody following Aquinas. Aquinas didn't use those exact words, but it's the same idea. A purely actual actualizer, that God is pure act. He has no potential. A way to think about that is th there's nothing that God could be that he's not. Um, he's unchanging. I think we have pretty good scriptural uh, reasons to, to support the idea that God is unchanging. Like Malachi 3.6 says, I do not change. Um, so that, that's a pretty good example. Um, I'm not sure if that's clear enough. But there's also passages that talk about God seemingly changing, like changing his mind. So there, there are tough passages to work through there. That's far off from this discussion right now, though. Maybe we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Uh, but negating this, saying none of that actually occurs, that actually leads you to an infinite regress, that vicious regress that we talked about before, where we mm -hmm. said that that's, that's not where we want to go with our explanations. Okay, so why, why is this thing God, once we established that there must be something that causes all this stuff without itself being caused, why is that thing God? And typically these arguments come in kind of two stages. The first stage is establishing that there must be this first cause that we've been talking about. We've already been establishing that. And then the second stage is usually teasing out some of the attributes of what this divine explanation would be like. What would it be like to be something that's pure actuality? Um, what would it be like to be something that's immutable, that can't change? And we would say that, um, one, it has to be one being. And we would argue, and again, we're not going to argue for every single divine attribute from this argument. You can get a lot out of, the, out of this first way. We're just going to give a couple. Um, but we would say that, well, God would have to be one. And why is that? Well, if there were more than one beings that were purely actual, there would have to be something that distinguishes being one from being two. But if there was something that distinguishes one from the other, there'd be a potential that's not actualized in one of them that would have to be actualized in the other. But that's, that's incoherent because it's pure actuality. So you get monotheism right out of that. You have to have one God, not a bunch of them. That just, you know, uh, so that's really helpful. That gets you like immediately, if you're narrowing down from religions, you get, okay, it's going to be Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. Right off the bat. We would argue again that it's immutable. It has no potentiality within itself, no susceptibility to change. We'd also have to argue that this being is outside of time and space because anything in time and space is susceptible to change. 
It would have to be immaterial. If anything was material, it could have parts that could be rearranged within it, uh, like atoms and stuff. Just think about that. It could, it could, uh, those parts could be rearranged. So it would have to be an immaterial, spaceless, timeless, immutable being. That was one. And this is what we call God. Next, if you think of any, any power that's actualized in the world, any, any actualization of potential, my, my ability to pick up this bottle, or my ability to press a button on my keyboard, anything like that, any use of power, so to speak, power just meaning change or anything like that. God is ultimately the source of all of those things. So God's all powerful. So you can start to get some of these attributes teased out from this argument. And we will stop it there for this, for this first way. Uh, and then efficient cause. In the world, we can see that things are caused, but it is not possible for something to be the cause of itself because this would entail that it exists prior to itself, which is a contradiction. If that by which it is caused is itself caused, then it too must have a cause. But this cannot be an infinitely long chain. So there must be a cause which is itself not caused by anything further. This everyone understands to be God. All right. <clears throat> so the efficient cause. So what we mean by efficient cause is is this. So way, way back a uh, couple thousand or a few thousand years ago, uh, Greek philosophers came up with these four causes. One of them was the material cause, which is what something is made out of. One of them is the formal cause, which is what something is. And then we actually have two arguments about um, the last two causes, which is efficient cause and final cause. Final cause is the purpose of something. And then efficient cause is what actually causes something. What's so if, if, I, uh, if I knock over the book, I'm the efficient cause of this book falling over because I caused it, all right? So um, we can talk about this in accidentally ordered chains or essentially ordered chains. Either one works. So an accidentally ordered chain, we would be talking about like the Kalam cosmological argument, which we went over another day, which we can get from uh, scientific evidence and philosophical reasoning. But we aren't going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the five ways, which is this essentially ordered chain. So what we'll be talking about here is with this efficient cause explanation, and we have some overlap with a couple of these arguments, by the way, is like this. This is an example we would give. A plant depends on sunlight, and the sunlight depends on gravity, which depends on mass, and it's kind of like that chandelier idea, okay? Um, so we have to have some efficient cause, some thing actually causing it all, okay? And so because we don't want to overlap a couple of things, we have a specific objection on here that we want to talk about, which is that third point, which is what caused God. This is... Uh, something you'll hear all the time, especially by popular atheists and, and not academic atheists. Academic atheists pretty much never bring this up because um, it's been answered uh, so many different times. But a lot, it's it's known as like the schoolboy answer because it's the first thing people think of. Uh, what cause God if uh, everything needs a cause or something like that? So we, we want to make sure that... Um, people understand the concept of God when we're talking about this. So... Um, we, we also want to ensure that people don't think we're evading it. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, in, in another argument for God, the ontological argument, a lot of people will come up with objections, and the Christian just has to say, well, you don't actually understand God if you're saying that objection. And so we would kind of say the same thing with this. If you ask what caused God, we would say, you don't actually understand the concept of God. If something caused God, that thing wouldn't be God. Um, so we would say that God is un cause. So there is no efficient cause for God. He is, again, the, the rock bottom, the bedrock of, of all reality. He is the efficient cause of everything else, and he doesn't need a cause because we would have to have something that is uncaused, eternal, again, outside of time, like Will was saying earlier. And so when we get through this whole idea of efficient causes, like, oh, God has to be, uh, if we go back to the analogy, the anchor in the ceiling holding up the chandelier, we get a couple things. Um, a couple of attributes. So one would be a seity, which is just his like independence, um, his self-existence, his necessity, he's necessary. Um, nothing else caused him. Uh, we also get infinity. He is infinite. Um, and so he doesn't have limits. Mm -hmm. And then also we get his eternality. He is uh, eternal because uh, he doesn't have a cause. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that one's pretty 
easy to get from. And so we get these attributes. And at the end of these five ways, we're going to have a whole list of attributes, which is how everyone describes God. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's important to, the first and second way are quite similar, if you can already tell. There are distinct arguments, but they're, they are quite similar. They're the most similar of any of the five ways. But to really hit again on that point of the what caused God objection, because that is the most common answer that you will, if you present the sort of idea of things need causes or explanations, um, you will immediately get hit with the objection of, but what caused God? And then if you say, well, God doesn't need a cause, then it sounds like you're special pleading, which is a, a fallacious way of reasoning where you're saying, everything needs this except the one thing that I don't want it to apply to. We would say, what caused God is, is a question akin to who is the bachelor's wife? It's an incoherent question. It, it fails to understand the concept of God, as Samuel was talking about. Mm. So these arguments aren't present, the arguments we're presenting don't assert everything needs a cause. That's not what the arguments are saying. The arguments are saying something like everything that changes has a cause. Everything that's contingent requires a cause. That's what the argument is. It is not everything needs a cause, so God. It is because then you run into the, the objection of what caused God, rightly so. But when we say everything that changes requires a cause, God is exempt from that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all I got for that. All right, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is the contingency uh, kind of way to demonstrate God's existence. So here's what it says. In the world, we see things that are possible to be and possible not to be. In other words, perishable things. Uh, but if everything were contingent and thus capable of going out of existence, so contingent just kind of means dependent, um, then nothing would exist now. But things clearly do exist now. Therefore, there must be something that is imperishable, um, not dependent. Uh, so a necessary being. This, mm -hmm. everyone understands, to be God. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, the third way that Aquinas goes over. Right. And again, this is a similar idea. Is anybody else really bothered by that why? That's just not in the right spot. Kind of just didn't format right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that got through the editing process. Um, so this idea of contingency and necessity. We've gone over this before, I think. Um, but this idea is important for understanding this argument. There are contingent things and necessary things. All of us in this room are contingent. Had, had my parents never met, I would not be a thing. I wouldn't exist. I could not be. Um, and a necessary thing is something that could never fail to exist. So 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's a necessary truth. That could never not be true. Laws of logic, those are necessary truths. But the fact will exist is true, but it didn't have to be true. I could have not existed. And Aquinas and people that take up this argument, they say that we can't just have only contingent things. Everything around us seems contingent. Um, but we can't only defer our explanations to other contingent things because they aren't ultimate explanations for anything. Contingent things don't explain themselves. They aren't good grounding for explanation. And so if we want to push this idea of explaining why this happens and why this happens, why this happens, you're going to be pushed ne necessarily to a, a being that is itself unexplained by anything else. It, it is itself its own explanation, which is God. Um, so perishable contingent causes lack ultimate explanatory power. We can't just have an endless series of contingent explanations. That's not a good route to go, like, like, like we talked about before. Uh, and then God, what we get out of this is this idea of necessity, of a necessary being that grounds everything else, isn't explained by anything other than its own necessity. It just has to exist. That's what we would say. Mm -hmm. um, wait, did you go over the attributes? Necessary. Oh, okay. Sounds good. But um, I think one what, is actually kind of hard to get out of this. But yeah, but that that's okay. There is one more thing I, I, I do want to just highlight: the circularity of an argument. So if we do say that, okay, let's say instead of a necessary being, we just say, oh, could an infinite causes explain the infinite, uh, like infinite series of things going in and out of existence? Why can't we just have an infinite series of causes? You'd run into a circular argument, which is like, okay, why is there eternal thing? Uh, things eternally going in and out of existence, oh, because we have eternal causes. But then you'd have to ask, why do we have eternal causes? Oh, because things are eternally going in and out of existence. Um, and then it would just go back and forth, circular, and it would be circular, which is not helpful. It really doesn't explain anything. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing I would like to add. 
a really good practical, like a practical way to get this idea going in your mind, and if you're talking with somebody, is to simply ask what Leibniz asked with the contingency argument, which is, why does the universe even exist at all? That's a good question to start get the ball rolling. Why does this universe even exist? What explains the universe? And if you start asking, what would it take to be an explanation of the universe itself? Uh, you start to bump into a lot of these divine attributes. Mm. So that's a good question to get the ball rolling. Yeah. Okay, De degrees of perfection. This is a neat argument. It says, we see things in the world that vary in degrees of goodness, truth, nobility, etc. For example, well-drawn circles are better than poorly drawn ones. Moreover, some, substance, some substances are better than others, since living things are better than non-living things, and animals are better than plants, in testimony of which no one would choose to lose their senses for the sake of having the longevity of a tree. But judging something as being more or less implies some standard against which it is being judged. Therefore, there is something which is best and most true, and this everyone understands to be God. So this probably has to be my favorite way of Aquinas. I just think it's such a cool concept, degrees of perfection. We just look around the world and some things aren't perfect and we know it, and then some things are worse than others and we know it. Mm -hmm. We might disagree on what things are better than others, but that doesn't really prove anything. We, we just disagree on something. Um, but there, there are a couple types of degrees of perfection we could see in the world. One would be moral perfection. So we see things like love or justice or, or mercy, kindness, and those we would say are moral perfections. And then there are non-moral perfections, so things that are, have power or knowledge. So like me and Will, we don't have perfect knowledge. We, um, Will can lift a lot of weights, but he is not. He can't live. He can't lift two million pounds. So he he doesn't have uh, perfect power, or he can't cause certain things to happen. He doesn't have that power. Um, so those are the two types of perfections we could we could talk about. Okay, um, and so what what this leads us to is a standard. Right? Mm -hmm. That Aquinas was talking about. How do we know that these things aren't perfect? How do we know that this lacks something? What, like, we have to be judging it against something. C.S. Lewis also used this idea a lot. We only know a crooked line by knowing what a straight line is, right? So, um, how can we explain these imperfections, right? Well, one thing we would say nothing gives what it does not have, as in, like, imperfect things or flawed things cannot give itself justice. So I'm imperfectly just. I can't give myself justice or something. So, 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 so something else that is perfect had to have given it to me. Okay? And this also connects to the idea of transcendentals, which is just truth, goodness, and beauty, which is why we call God the true, the good, and the beautiful. Okay? Because he is perfect in those respects, and everything mm -hmm. participates in that in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in the end, we would pretty much say he's the standard by which all things are measured. So... Um, uh, as Aquinas put it, this is what we understand to be God. Yeah. Uh, without it, we wouldn't know if things are actually lacking or not. Yes. Yeah. That's good. All right. The last way to demonstrate God's existence is this. The final cause or the end. Uh, so kind of like the purpose of something. So here we go. We see various non-intelligent objects in the world behaving in regular ways. This cannot be due to chance, since then they would not behave with predictable results. So their behavior must be set. But it cannot be set by themselves, since they are non-intelligent and have no notion of how to set behavior. Therefore, their behavior must be set by something else, and by implication, something that must be intelligent. This, everyone understands to be God. Mm -hmm. Just a quick note again, uh, these are not a definitive five ways and nothing else to prove God. Uh, Aquinas himself has probably 15 or 20 unique arguments for God's existence in his corpus of work, but uh, the five ways have kind of become a famous uh, sort of bundle of arguments uh, to describe in succession with each other. So that's why we're going over it. It's a very uh, well-known idea in apologetics. Uh, but this last one, the final cause or the fifth way, uh, arguing from the idea of final causality. Uh, this could be called a teleological argument. 
or Aquinas' version of a teleological argument. We've talked about that before when he talked about like uh, an argument from intelligent design. Uh, but they're distinct ideas here. So Aquinas means something a little bit different by that. In intelligent design, I have up there, yeah, first point. Intelligent yep. design versus telos. Intelligent design is something like um, the laws of nature are really, really finely tuned. And so therefore, it makes sense that there's an intelligent designer behind it. Um, or the, the complications of the human cell is such that it requires a designing intelligence. Um, that's, that's a different idea than what Aquinas is going for. Aquinas is arguing from this idea of final causality, which means the end for which things are made. What's the purpose of things? So like uh, Samuel was using the idea of a book. If he knocks off the book, he's the efficient cause of the, of the book falling over. Mm -hmm. uh, but just if you just consider the book itself, what's the final cause of a book to be read? The purpose for which it's made is to be read. That's the final cause of the end of the book is to be read. Um, we could argue that there are things and tendencies within us as human beings that we ourselves didn't choose. It's just baked into who we are. So us as human beings, we have a tendency to seek the truth. We, we tend to, to seek truth as opposed to falsehood. We want to know what's true and believe what's true. That's just baked into who we are. We tend to seek friendship and love with one another. We send, tend to seek community. That's part of who we are. It's part of our nature. We didn't choose that. It's just how we are. Similarly, with inanimate things. So acorns grow into oak trees and not sea lions. Like that. It's such an obvious and kind of silly idea to think about, but it's true. Why is that? Why do acorns never grow into anything other than oak trees? It's a, it's a, it's a worthy idea to kind of ponder and think about what, why that is. Why is there such a predictability in nature? Why do things have a, a goal orientation to their existence? There's, there's always something that's going towards. Trees, human beings, whatever. Um, so all the things in the world have this sort of intelligibility to them a goal directedness, something that they're moving towards, and yet they didn't choose these things for themselves. And so Aquinas would argue that this is a way to reason that there's a, a preceding intelligence or a providential mover that is causing this to be behind the entire world. And he governs all these things towards their natural ends. And I think that this highlights the attributes of God being him, his omniscience, him being all-knowing, and his providence. Him providentially governing the world, I think, is, is two attributes you could highlight from the fifth way. Of course, there's more you could you could take out of it, but those are just two. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. All right. Uh, for our last thing before we finish is we keep calling these ways and not proofs. Like we aren't proving God. We have ways to demonstrate His existence. So we're gonna kind of go over what these do. The five ways, why are they ways, uh, what, what are the uses? And the first one is this. Um, these arguments were actually part of Dominican training to prepare them for ministry. Um, What's a Dominican, Samuel? A Dominican is a, a type of monk. So uh, Aquinas was a Dominican. Um, and he, uh, he just lived a life that contemplated God, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And so they, they would be the people you go to for knowledge about the Bible and God, they, uh, they, they would well, do what we call sermons today, right? Mm -hmm. They would write letters, they would write uh, books on all this stuff. So they were, they were the leading, think of it, scholars of, of their day, these, these monks. And there were different kind of like sects of them, but uh, Dominicans are the ones we're talking about because that's what Aquinas was, mm -hmm. right? And so they, they would use these to prepare them for ministry, uh, and they would go through all this stuff. And so the, the ways to demonstrate God's existence, we would say, are essential for, um, we could say, like pastors to know or uh, Christians to know because it prepares us for that. So, um, again, we, we've talked about this before, but they can support our faith. They can give us these attributes and reasons why we believe in these attributes that we were talking about. Like, why is God this way? Do we actually have a reason for it? Um, and we can, again, also minister to people with them, right? Then also we want to highlight, these are just sketches, right? Um, so we gave you kind of the intro, even though it was a lot of information. It was, it was for beginners. Aquinas goes way deeper into these. Um, so yeah, they aren't, the, these aren't the definitive uh, and most thought out ways to do this. Um, and then also, it's saying what is not by uh, highlighting what is. So like when he says this, everyone understands 
to be God. So, so we would say, oh, God isn't this and this and this and this. It has to be this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like yeah. God, God does not change. Uh, God is not made up of parts. God is not in time and space. But we're not saying like God is exactly this thing. We mm-hmm. just know he's not those other things. Yeah. And a lot of theology is us reasoning like that. Mm-hmm. And um, what, I, what I put for the last point is just uh, highlighting the four causes and also knowledge of God, um, distinguishing that, like, to actually understand something, it's actually to know the four causes and not just have knowledge. Because uh, mm-hmm. I, can, I can know about something without actually knowing what caused it, what it's for, something, something like that. Um, mm-hmm. so, so, yeah, this is, this is the function of the ways. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's it. This is, uh, so I'll end with a, a prayer, and this is a prayer that Aquinas himself prayed daily, as the legend goes. There's lots of legend from Christian history, though, that is probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool to think that this is a prayer that he actually said. So it says, O merciful God, grant that I may desire ardently, search prudently, recognize truly, and bring to perfect completion whatever is pleasing to you, for the praise and glory of your name. Amen. Amen.